The portion of God's word that will guide our thoughts today comes from John chapter 19, verses 13 through 18. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king. Pilate said to the Jews, but they all shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. This is God's word. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you in abundance from God our Father. Dear worshipers at the cross. Today, let's talk about six very powerful little words. You all know these words. You all know these six powerful words. You learned them when you were little. In fact, our kindergarten teacher has a lesson on these six words because she knows that if she teaches these six words to her students, she will unlock their learning potential. Here are the six words, who, what, where, when, how, and why. Educators often call these words the six W's because most of them start with a W, how has a W at the end. And these six little words are tools that enable us to ask very pointed questions and gain critical information. Journalists use these words to write their stories. Researchers use these words to solve a problem. Detectives use these words to catch a criminal. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. You know, our reading for today is very short. It's 131 words, and I timed it out. It takes you about 40 seconds to read our portion of scripture for today. Yet, like a master journalist, the Apostle John writes down this account for us, and he enables us to answer all of those questions. Today, we're going to use our six W's and examine the account of Jesus' crucifixion. And by doing that, we'll appreciate what Jesus did for us. Here's how our reading starts. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. So those verses set the scene for us and they enable us to answer two of our questions where and when. John tells us that Pilate brought Jesus out to the judgment seat. Now, the judgment seat was more than just a chair. It was kind of a platform, think of a stage, and there was a chair on top of it, and the Roman governor would sit on that chair to deliver verdicts on a trial. So Pilate's sitting on this chair on this raised platform and Jesus is standing there next to him and he's bloody and he's bruised. That's where we are. And John tells us 
when this happens as well. He tells us it's Passover week and it's the day of preparation. The day of preparation is Friday. They prepared for the Sabbath on Friday, which was called the day of preparation. John even tells us the hour. He says it was the sixth hour. We can't be exactly sure when that is because there's some debate on whether John is using Roman or Hebrew time. But suffice it to say, sometime between 9 a.m. and noon, Pilate brings Jesus out to deliver his verdict. And you know, the inclusion of these details tell us something about John and his gospel. John is recording real events. He's not making this stuff up. These details that this happened in a specific place and at a specific time ground us in reality. John wants us to know that this actually happened. He tells us where and when. This is what happens next. Here is your king, Pilate said, to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. With these verses, we can answer a few more of our W's. First of all, who? Who was involved at these events? Well, obviously Jesus. He's the one on trial. But then there's Pilate. I always find Pilate to be very interesting because at first he tries to do the right thing. Three times he tells the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. I'm going to release him. Then he even goes a step further and he has Jesus flogged to see if that will pacify the bloodthirsty crowd. But for a long time, Pilate is trying to get Jesus set free. But from these words, we learn who Pilate is. He's a very pragmatic politician. He tried, but he was not willing to risk a riot, and he was not willing to risk the Jews bad-mouthing him to the emperor for the sake of Jesus. He was pragmatic, so he condemned an innocent man to death. But you know, as sad as that is, I think the chief priests are even more disappointed. These men are supposed to be preaching and teaching about the righteousness and justice of God. These men are supposed to be looking for the Messiah and telling their fellow Israelites about the hope of the Messiah. Yet, who do we find here? Men so filled with selfishness and hate that they're willing to say we have no king but Caesar. You know, I I don't think we really appreciate that statement. We have no king but Caesar. Maybe I can help explain this way. Saying we have no king but Caesar would kind of be like if Donald Trump said something like this. You know what? We should open up our southern border. Let's blow up the fences we already have. Let's build bridges over the Rio Grande. Let them all in. If Donald Trump said that, that would be a complete flip-flop. That would be a complete loss of integrity. It's the exact opposite of what he's been promoting. That's kind of like what the Jews are saying here. When they say, we have no king but Caesar. The Jews hated the fact that they were under Roman rule. They wanted an independent nation. Yet these men hated Jesus so much that they were willing to give up their integrity and claim allegiance to Caesar. So we have a pragmatic Roman politician and we have some turncoat Jewish leaders. Now let's think about what 
is happening here. And what is happening here is a complete tragedy. Jesus is given an unfair trial. The king of the heavens and the earth is mocked, ridiculed, and condemned to a painful and humiliating death. What is happening here is a complete injustice and a farce. And our final words for today answer how. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. How was this carried out? With brutal Roman speed and efficiency. The Romans made Jesus carry his own cross through the city outside to a hill. Then they nailed him on the cross and they set him up to be mocked until he died. And Romans are efficient, so as long as they're executing somebody, might as well get three done. So they crucify two others with him. It's a very simple account. 131 words, yet we're able to answer five of our W's. Where did this happen? At the judgment seat in Jerusalem and at Golgotha. When did this happen? Passover week, Friday in the morning. What happened? An innocent man was given an unjust trial and condemned to death. How did it happen? They nailed him to some wood until he died. This story is so simple that we retell it every Sunday. Almost every Sunday we retell this story with the simple words, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified. But we still haven't answered one of our questions. Why? Why did this happen? Why did Jesus suffer injustice? Why did he have to be tortured? Why did he have to be mocked and ridiculed? Well, the answer is right in front of us. In fact, the answer is us. Why did this have to happen? Well, we're often unjust to one another. So Jesus had to suffer injustice. We often cause each other pain. So Jesus suffered. We often mock and ridicule each other. So that's what Jesus suffered. We have to die because of our sins. So that's why Jesus died. Why did it happen? Because of us. But it also happened for us. Jesus suffered all the injustice, the mocking, the injustice, and the pain so that our sins could be forgiven. Why? For us. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated for our offering.